Worth, Worth was just saying, you know, he was saying, referencing Steve's book about how Steve had talked about the meeting and um, the meeting of the body of Christ and what it looks like and so forth. And, and he said it's been a, and it is an example. Today was an example of what he was talking about in the book. And I said, yeah. And I said, honestly, I'm even talking about it. You know, that's kind of the direction I'm going. And if you don't know where I'm going by now, it's that. It's keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus, fixing our gaze upon him. Hebrews chapter 12. I'm going to read verse 1 and a little bit of verse 2. Hebrews chapter 12. I feel like this could be a, just a, a, a basis for this house. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. The word says, let us lay aside every weight, every obstacle, every hindrance, and the sin, the disobedience, which so easily ensnares us, and let us run the race with endurance. Verse 2 looking unto Jesus. That is the call to this house. Lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily besets us and hinders us, and let us run with endurance, looking unto Jesus. That word endurance means patiently and steadfastly. Let us run patiently and steadfastly. And I love, I love this too. This is a, a part of the definition when I looked it up. It said, endurance is the character of a person who is not swayed from his deliberate person or purpose. Endurance is the character of a person that's not easily swayed from his deliberate purpose. The purpose that we're on is the goal and the prize is Jesus. We want to run steadfastly, patiently, not wavering, not swerving. Run with endurance towards that prize. Let us run towards Jesus and not be swayed from that deliberate purpose, the race that is set before us, the purpose being that we would become his bride, that we would be in relationship with him, that we would walk with him, that we would talk with him, that, we that he would be the bridegroom of the church, that we would love him and be intimately involved with him. That is the purpose. That is the race. It's Jesus. If I had one thing to say, again, it's, a, it's a kind of a common thing, but it's all about Jesus. That's the deal. If you want to know where we're going, Jesus is the goal. We want to get to him. We want to know him more. We want to get to closer to him. We want to, we want to be more in love with him. I, I hope we can look back a year from now like we did last year in December and see how far we've come in our walk with him, in our relationship with him, how we've grown, how we know him better now than we did then. I feel like my responsibility almost to this house is to keep us constant on track to that thing. I feel, like, I feel like if I don't do anything else, we've got great teachers, we've got all the things that we need. I feel like my role more than anything is to keep us pointed and to keep us going straight ahead and not distracted. I feel like that most everything I talk about is pretty much the same thing because God has given us a mission and a purpose, and, it, and it's not to run in every direction. It's to go straight towards him. It's to be a witness of what we've seen and heard. It's to be connected to him and to love him in such a way, to know him better, more than we've ever known him in the past, that we can be a witness of what we have seen and heard. In Revelation chapter 2, since we're studying, I'm going to go there. Go ahead and turn to Revelation chapter 2. I'm going to start in verse 18. Revelation chapter 2, starting in verse 18. 
It says, and to the angel, which this is something we learned from Neil, when it's saying to the angel of the church, it's talking, that word actually translates messenger or pastor. So Jesus is talking to the pastor of this church. And these churches represent the church too. So he's saying, and to the pastors of the church in Thyatira, right. These things say the Son of God. This is Jesus talking. Who has eyes like a flame of fire. Has the ability to see straight through you is what it's talking about. He knows your every thought. He knows your heart. He knows exactly what is going on. You're not going to deceive him. You're not going to confuse. You don't, can't hide. You can't look all holy and have a mess going on on the inside. He knows exactly. He's saying to the, to the ark, I have eyes that I see exactly where you're at. I know exactly where your heart is. I know. He has eyes like flames of fire. Jesus is who we're talking about. And his feet are like fine brass. That stands for divine judgment. He's able, and Neil's talked about his feet, able to stomp sin. He, he's got the power. He, he's got the ability to, he, he's just. I know Steve said this before, that it would be better for God to have all of creation in hell than it would be to allow one drop of sin in his presence. That's pretty tough. But he's holy. See, that's what we got to understand. We can't, we can't deceive him. He's holy. And we know that we're not perfect, but it's by his blood that we can come. Thank you, Lord. So this is Jesus saying to the church, the one, the son of God that has eyes like flame of fire and feet like fine brass. I know your works. I know your love. I know your service and I know your faith and your patience. And as far for your works, the last are, are more than the first. I almost felt like he was talking to the ark right here because he said to the ark and to the church, I know your works. That means, I looked these up, it means the things that you're intending to do. I know your love, the love for God and for one another. I know your service. I know the ministry that you're in. I know that you're a teacher, Neil. I know that what you're doing and, 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 and how you're being a witness. I know these things about you. I know your faith, that strong conviction that God exists and Jesus is the Son of God, the Messiah. See, again, that's the revelation that we've been truly getting. And even the, uh, the word that the Lord gave us for this year is that we would truly know, not just know in our head, not have head knowledge, but know that he is God and that Jesus is the son of God, the Messiah. He is the one. We, that we won't be like the, 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 uh, the ones at the, at the coming of Christ that knew all about him, had the first five books of the Bible memorized, that expected a Messiah to come, was it looking for him, but yet didn't recognize him when he came. I want us to know and to recognize him when he comes. So this is the one. This is what he's saying to the church. Nevertheless, I have the, a few things against you. Because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants, to commit sexual immorality, and eat things sacrificed to idols. I'll be honest with you. I don't think the, I, I'm not saying that. God help us. I'm not saying that anything's not possible. But the place that we are of our love for him and, and just what God has been doing, I, I don't think the enemy will send the Jezebel spirit necessarily to get us start committing adultery. Not prayerfully, not. Sexual immorality. But let me say this. Anything that you put before God is adultery. If you are the bride of Christ and you 
want to be with this over here instead of be with your husband. It's adultery. You're putting something else before him. So I believe what the Lord, well, I'll go on. I'm going to go on and tell you. And then he speaks over in verse 24. I'm going to skip a little bit. We'll start right there in verse 24. Then he's talking to, to those right here that didn't do that. I, I think we're okay right now. But the danger is, is getting sidetracked on some, something other than him. But these are, this is now starting in verse 21, 24 is the ones that didn't get sidetracked. Now to you I say, and to the rest in Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan, talking about allowing this Jezebel spirit to do this, and they say, I will put on you no other burden, but hold fast what you have till I come. And he overcomes and keeps my works until the end. To him I will give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessels. And I also have received from my father, and I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. I feel like right now for the church, for the ark, our biggest threat is to be seduced by Jezebel spirit to focus on the results of focusing on Jesus. See, when you've put your focus and your soul attention on God and make him the priority, things will happen. As a result of that, things will happen. The danger is getting focused on the things that are happening and taking our attention off of the one that's making it happen. Anything that takes our attention away from God is an idol. An idol replaces the one thing, and he, God, the Bible says, is a jealous God and will not allow anything else to take his place. A couple of weeks ago, I was talking to Steve that last time he was here, and I was asking him as he, as he was leaving, I said, Steve, if you had one thing you could tell us in a nutshell, if you could just put it real quick to me before you get in the car, tell me what you, would, what you feel like the, the church needs to know right now. And he kind of said something, but I think there was other people around, and, and I didn't really catch it, and I don't even know if he said it or not. But uh, no, I know how Steve is, and I'm sure he pondered that and thought about that question. A week later, he called me. Last Sunday night, as a matter of fact, he called me. And um, he, uh, he, what he went to say, I'm trying to find it here in my notes if I can, so I can say it right. He said, because of our desire, because of the desire of this house to give God what he wants and be unwilling to compromise what he has told us, that we would begin to experience the result of our pursuit and love for Jesus. All right? He, so what he said, if I can put it in a nutshell, is because we have set our focus on, on, on the Lord, because we've been unwilling to compromise, we've been running straight ahead, that results of the result of that is going to, things, miraculous things are going to, we're going to begin to experience miraculous things. I was going, thank God, that's good. He went on to say uh, that we were going to begin to experience a greater degree than in the past supernatural, miraculous things. I'm going, yes, God, come on. I mean, this is good. He said that things like healings in a greater way are going to begin to happen. Deliverance, revelation, revival, finances, marriages, all that are going to begin to happen. We had a testimony of it this morning. Out of a result of us putting our focus on him. He said this is going to be a power. But he said the danger is that you will begin to focus on those things instead of what created those things. See, that's the danger. He, he said, this is how he said it. I wrote this down. He said, don't focus on the peripheral things you see, but continue to focus on the target. Allow the peripheral things to push 
and encourage you toward the goal but not become the goal. Okay? So as I thought about that, I thought, man, like Steve, that has to be a little deep. As I thought, I said, well, explain that to me again, the peripheral things. He said, when you, you know, that's what he said. He said, when you have your focus straight ahead, things are going to begin to happen. Miraculous things. Healings may start happening. Miraculous healings. You can see it. You can see them out here, but your focus has to stay there, straight ahead. You can't begin to look at the healing and put your focus on that. See, what happens and has for much, we're not the only church, I can promise you, that is currently and has been putting, going straight towards Jesus. What stops most of it? What stops those revivals that spring up and they last for a week or last six weeks or last six months or six years? It's when they begin to take their focus on the revelation and the reviving and going towards Jesus and begin to put it on everything else that's happening as a result. What we tend to do is when God begins to do miraculous healings is we start having healing services. And then it all suddenly becomes about me laying hands on somebody to get them healed. God is the healer, not me. We put our focus on God and God heals. We, we, we get set free from drug addiction, and the first thing we want to do is go start a program to help people get delivered because we're so thankful that we have been delivered. God delivered you, not that you can set people free from that, that's in bondage, but that you can run straight to him, that you can walk with him and have a relationship with him. God restored your marriage so that you can bear fruit and that you can be in love with him and, and do become all that he created you to be. So we don't have to start a marriage restoration program. We just need to chase God. We just need to run as hard as we can go straight to God. Let all this take care of. Keep our focus here. What's happening out here, what, when I, as I walk down the aisle, somebody gets healed, somebody gets restored, somebody's marriage takes off. Praise God. We can give God all the glory. I celebrate with Donald and Kelly. But I'm not going to go, and now we're just going to focus on marriage the rest of our time. Our focus is on Jesus that, that restored the marriage. So thank you, Lord. See, this is, again, I feel like I'm beating a dead horse on a lot of this stuff, but it's revelation. This stuff is, I mean, we're getting something, and we've got to get it deep within our spirit. And I'll tell you why. It's because you go back to what you've been in. In the past, what we've seen out of church is when God does some powerful thing, then we build a ministry around it. And all of a sudden, it becomes about that ministry instead of God. So help us, Jesus. The danger of stopping and hindering what God is doing in this house is that we'll take our focus on him and begin to look at what is happening around us and begin to focus on that i believe with all my heart we're going to see miraculous things and it thank that's going to be awesome but our focus has to stay right there right to him as hard as we can run let's see where are we at our target is jesus he is the prize that's set before us. Steve said this too. I think he may have read this, I don't know, and I probably can't quote it correctly. But he said in the beginning, there was the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. They were in relationship with one another. It was a beautiful thing. Jesus' only goal was to please the Father. And they, and they said, let's create mankind. So they created man to commune with, to walk with, to talk with, and to be a family. And nothing changed. I love that. What happened when God, when Jesus, when they created creation of mankind, their focus didn't go off of one another to the creation 
It stayed right where it was in the beginning. Here's the deal. We experience a miraculous healing. Somebody walks in, has a tumor, and it hits the floor. The tumor hits the floor. Nothing changes. Our focus is Jesus. Drug addiction. Man, people getting delivered. Come and run into the altar to get born again, to get saved. Deliverance all over Mitchell, Avery, Yancey County. Nothing changes. Where we're going, nothing changes. Marriage is restored, nothing changes. So don't allow us, watchmen on the wall, prophets, elders, family of God, help. Keep us in bound. Don't let us ever begin to chase after the miracle. Don't let us chase after the healing. Let us chase after the healer. Out of the, after the deliverer, after the restorer, those things just happen because of our pursuit for him. Okay, where are we at? God told me months ago that we were, and we've experienced, I've seen it with, before my very eyes, that things were going to begin to happen naturally just because of our pursuit of him. And that's what's happening. These things, these miracles, we're not having to take uh, a year's class on how to heal the sick. They're just being healed because God's healing them. It's our pursuit for him. It happens because of our pursuit. It happens naturally. We didn't do a thing to help your marriage. But God did. Thank you, Lord. We're not qualified to counsel. I mean, it was a couple of times we prayed with Kelly. And I said, oh, I don't know what to tell you. All I know to do is pray. I don't know what to tell you how to save your marriage. But I know the one that does. Let's pray. We're not, I'm telling you, the church is messed up by trying to be counselors. We're not counselors. The only thing I can do is point you to the one that has the answers. I don't have them. Okay, I'm going to shift a little bit, but it kind of ties it. Everything corporately flows from our individual lives. Catch that. Everything corporately flows from your individual life, your walk with the Lord, your devotion, your individual time, your prayer life, your worship, everything flows corporately from that, from your individual place. In order to maintain corporately order, Jesus must be the target of our individual lives. According to the word of God, the proper order for our lives is seek first the kingdom of God. Jesus is the king and he is the kingdom. Seek first Jesus. Make him the priority of our lives and his righteousness, being in right standing, being obedient to, to his word and to what he says. And everything else the Bible says will take care of itself. One of the questions that we often get asked here at the Ark, I've even had some of the pastors down at the, the coast asked me a question. I really didn't have a good answer for it, but I think the Lord has showed me. Is how do we maintain order without an apparent order in the meeting? I mean, one of the things that we celebrate here is the freedom that we have. The freedom to worship, the freedom to express ourselves, the freedom to be led by the Spirit of God. Well, how do we maintain order without a bulletin to order it for us? We don't have an agenda. We don't have a timeline. And we have freedom to be led by the Spirit of God. Yet we don't have confusion and chaos. That's pretty amazing. Because you couldn't do that in most places, I'll be honest. You couldn't be led like we are in most churches because you'd have a, a train wreck. It'd be chaos. With such freedom to minister to God, how do we maintain the order and not allow it to get out of hand? That's basically the question. 
Have you ever thought about it? I have. I've even asked myself, I don't know, how, how do we, how is it, how's this working? Do we need, and I'll be honest with you, there was, because I had people say, you know, we need to, we need to begin to put some things in place, and what if somebody comes in, and something crazy, and, and, you know, how do we, we need to order this thing, and I thought, yeah, we do, we need to make sure we're protected, and, and, uh, and I'd start writing, and then God would say no, and I, it, he wouldn't really tell me why. And I'd say, well, God, what are we supposed to do? And he'd say, family. And I didn't understand that. I thought, well, okay, but what is, how's that going to order? How's that going to protect us? But there's protection and there is order in the family. You know, you get the right family, you got it. The answer is, here's the answer. You got to have a people with individual order in their own lives. The only way we're going to keep order is that we're ordered individually before the Lord. Thank God. I mean, I give God all the praise, but we got a very mature body here and not, we're so fortunate. I don't know how, if you realize how fortunate this house is, but the reason we can enjoy the freedom that we enjoy and not have chaos is because there's order in the individuals that make up this house. You get the order by making him first, seek first the kingdom of God, seek first Jesus and his righteousness. Everything else will take care of itself. I don't have to have a bulletin and a program and, a, and a something all worked out in order to, con, you know, to keep people from going crazy. Because there's order because you're ordered. Corporate order or the lack thereof is the result of the order that is in our own individual lives. Corporate worship is a result of private worship. Now, when you think about that, you can't necessarily judge it by what's up here on the stage because we can go out and hire a worship team, and, man, we can have some incredible what looks like worship, incredible performances where you'd think, my God, that place is a house of worship. If you want to see, if you want to evaluate the worship, look out here. The worship of this house is directly, we are what you are in your individual life. If you worship at home, if, you've got a, if you are a worshiper that love the Lord and, and just spend time alone with him, then, then we will be a house of worship if we are worshipers. We will be a house of prayer. You can, I, one person can get up and pray an awesome prayer. I used to have them writ out, written out so I could really pray them good. You can evaluate, you can judge a place of prayer by seeing the praying people. I love to hear y'all pray because it gives me a sense of where you are. We will be known as a house of prayer when we pray. Not when somebody up here has a good prayer that we can read. We will be an ordered church with order, giving God everything he desires when individually we're ordered with him and me individually giving him what he desires. Much of the church in America has implemented the world's way of bringing order to the church and the reason being, I believe with all my heart, is that in, or, in order to have ordered lives, you got to be disciples. You have to be a student of the Lord. You have to be a follower of God. And what we've done, instead of making disciples, that takes a long time and is hard work, you know, we talk about we got maturity in this house, but this maturity didn't come in three days. This has been years and years and years. It's been year, It's been the time we've spent in the desert. It's been that time where, where we were, felt like that, 
where is God in all? What's, where's God gone? When we were dry and thirsty and crying out to God and where we needed him so bad, that, that hunger and thirst, that place that I've been in that dryness, and when I, see, that's the difference. That's the reason, I'll be honest with you, the reason I have a fire for God, the reason I never want to lose the presence of God in this place and I'm willing to fight for it, I don't care who's here and who isn't, give me the present. The reason is, is because I've been in the desert. I've been in a place where I couldn't find the presence. I was in church and didn't have the presence of God. That's a dry, thirsty place. And when I found it, I don't want to let go of it again. I don't want to let that thing go, and I'm willing, to fight. I'm willing to give up everything for that. So thank you, Lord. But the church in much of America, we've, what we've done is we've followed corporate order, Robert's Rules of Order. Is everybody familiar with that? It's, a, it's, it's, a, it's written out in a book how you conduct a meeting. That's what every political uh, when you, if you go to the county commissioner's meeting, they follow Robert's Rules of Order. If you go to any political thing, and the church has done the same thing. We have instant, and, and why do we do that? Why, why do they follow that outline? I was on the town board one time, and I know why. Because you limit, you know, you limit the time of the meeting. I can have a one-hour meeting, and we can be out on time or 30 minutes, or whatever we decide it wants to be. We set an agenda. We have a bulletin that tells us what we're going to do. So what that does is it protects me from you doing anything that's not on my list that I prepared. So you can't bring up something or do something that's not on the list, or I'll say, wait a minute, that's out of order. Sit back down. That's what we've done in the church. We've, you have to come to this one in order to say something because we don't know if it's on the agenda if we want to hear it or not. What does it, why? Why do you do that? Protects the time. It protects the leader from looking bad or something that might, what if you get up and say, I'm questioning what the direction you're going. You're chasing healing instead of the healer. What if, what if that happens? I need to hit the floor and say, you're right, brother. I repent before the Lord. We can enjoy a freedom like nobody else can as long as we keep there. Keep our number one thing in, in place. So you have a person. You think about it. This is Robert's Rules of Order. And look how it applies to the church. You have an agenda. You have a bulletin. That controls the time, the topics discussed, who can speak, and in what order. Okay? The person in authority calls the meeting to order, says a prayer, and follows the agenda systematically. We go right down the line. The type of order empowers the leaders. It keeps those in attendance in a place by not allowing anything to be brought up that's not on the agenda and thus protects the leaders. I, many times I've sit there and somebody brings up something in a town board meeting. We say, brother, you'll have to be put on the agenda for next time because that ain't on our agenda. You don't have to deal with it because you may not even know what the answer is, so you just put it off or you hope they don't come back. <laughs> so you control a meeting that way. I guarantee you Melinda has. Them. That's how she controls a meeting with the Chamber of Commerce. You have an order. You bring up something that ain't on the list, you don't get to talk about it. We'll put you on the agenda, and then we'll decide if we really want to or not. Uh, it ensures the length of time for this meeting, and it appears to those in attendance that you have a well-oiled machine. It looks good. Man, it functions. It flows. We're at the 12. We're at the steakhouse. <laughs> One of the books of the Bible that we use to examine church order is Paul's letter to the church in, in Corinth. It's one that we always go to when we're trying to see how does order work within the church. I found it interesting that there's 16 chapters in the book of Corinth. That's Paul's letter to the Corinthians, to the church in Corinth, discussing order. 16 books in the Bible, six, I mean in that, in that letter in 1 Corinthians. 63% of it, the first 10 chapters, 
deals with the order of the individual's lives. And the final six chapters that we always go to are the ones that deal with the order of the corporate service. So Paul himself, I believe, understood that if we can get, if, we'll, if, if I'm going to put 66% of my letter to the individual to help them get the order right in their life, then I think all I've got to do is cover a few things about corporate order, and it will be okay. Because you get your life ordered, this will be okay. So 60, uh, 63% was on the individual. And the things that he addressed in those first 10 chapters to the individuals were issues of division among ourselves, quarreling among ourselves, pride, sexual immorality, greed, suing one another, cheating one another. We're talking to the church now. This ain't just to the world. This is to the church. He said, quit suing. So could you not? I, I've thought about this a thousand times. Instead of me suing you and you suing me as the body of Christ, what if, what if we come and said to the church and said, man, we got a situation here, and we need somebody to decide what we need. It'd save you a whole lot of money, I guarantee it, for lawyers. If it didn't do anything else, but it even the Bible even says we're allowing a world to con, to to judge a church. Let the church judge it, and let the church say. But the main thing is, let's get our lie. We shouldn't be cheating one another as the body of Christ. We should be upright, have integrity. He addressed issues of pride, sexual immor immorality, greed, suing one another, cheating one another, self-centeredness, idolatry, marriage, learning to deny ourselves and learning to serve one another. That's what he addressed in those first ten chapters. After addressing the individual, he then addressed the order of the corporate service. He addressed issues of covering or authority in the services, order of the Lord's Supper, the use of spiritual gifts, the order of the individual in different parts of the body, the use of tongues in corporate service, and having order in meetings with sound doctrine. Well, you know, those are pretty cool, but honestly, those are pretty simple compared to the others. I mean, really, they just needed some basic instruction. When you're going to do the Lord's serve, uh, sup, you don't run in there and start eating everything on the plate. <laughs> I mean... He, he didn't need to spend a whole lot of time tell you you got to deal with some stuff in your life. It's just, okay, tell us how to. And when he talked about tongues, he wasn't saying there wasn't no such things as tongues. He said, do it in decency and order. You have tongues, have an interpreter in the corporate service. Tongues is fine. You can have tongues in your home life and in your private life, and, 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 and you know, it builds you up. In it. But when you, if I stand up and address you in, the, in tongues and have no interpreter, what good is it? So, so that's what he was saying. Just have order. So how do we maintain order and continue to enjoy the freedom of the spirit that's in this place? We got to continue to make disciples that live ordered lives surrendered to God.